You know, it's, it's funny to go through this transition in my life. Uh, I was coming back from a, a meeting that I had with my advisor, you know, the one that set me up with all those courses. And I was coming back to tell Tara how excited I was. And so I, I picked up my phone and I called. How many people ha do not have a cell phone? Anybody in here not have a cell phone? Or, like two or three? Well, for you, when you call someone and their phone rings, that's a ringtone. Everybody know what a ringtone is? And you can change your phone so when somebody different calls, you know, your phone will ring a different way. It'll have a different tone. Sorry. I don't know how better to explain it. Well, her ringtone for me is very, very soft, right? At least that's what I have to assume because she never picks up the phone when I call. <laughs> so I, I get on her quite a bit. How come you didn't pick up the phone? I had all this great stuff to tell you. Oh, I just didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. So I was thinking to myself, uh, i gotta, I got to find a better ringtone for her phone. So when I call, it'll be nice and loud. But, but then you know, I thought, what, what song, what tone really captures the, the essence of what it means to be Joshua Bowen? And, and this, this is what I came up with. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Somebody said, go out and Josh. Okie dokie. That's what I'm going to do. We love superheroes, don't we? I mean, I do. I do. I, I love watching them, right? Are we all set up up there? I mean, I love that stuff. I mean, don't you? You love watching Superman, you know, watching the superheroes. Why is it that we love that stuff so much? I mean, I, why do I like it so much? I mean, I think probably most of you do too. Batman and and Spider-Man, even though Superman can do the job of all those people. Uh, you know, we really love watching these guys. And why is it? I think some of it's the excitement, some of the fantastic things that these guys do, probably the boots. We really like that. <laughs> the tights. I wasn't going to go there, but uh, thank you for doing it. I think we love them so much because they do these things that we think we can't. You know, I mean, wow, who could, who could fill in the gap in a, in a railroad track, right? I mean, obviously Jim could, but, but you know, most people couldn't, right? Fill in that kind of a gap, you know, and hold on to the train as it, as it goes over. We love these superheroes, but I, I think that sometimes when we think about serving the Lord, we continue this mentality of, I'm not really super enough to do that. God, you couldn't possibly use me to fill that role because I'm not, I'm not strong enough. I'm, I don't have that superpower to be able to serve in that capacity. I'm not able to do that. And I guess when I thought about, here I am, I'm getting ready to leave. I'm getting ready to go to a school that, I got to tell you, I would have never expected to attend. Um, I had a 2.49 GPA in high school. For those of you that aren't up on education, that's not really good. It was, all right, we're tired of Josh being here. He graduates. So for me to get into that school was something that I thought, wow. I mean, that's a, super, that's a super feat by itself. Of course, it wasn't my doing, was it? The Lord said, Josh, I want you there, primarily because I want you away from here. No, I'm just kidding. 
But I think sometimes in our lives we downplay what the Lord can do through us, what power God can have in our own lives. And we say to ourselves, I can't serve in that capacity. I can't do that in my marriage. I can't do that in, at my job. I can't do that here at the church. Serve in that way because, boy, that's just above my pay grade. Right? I'm not a superhero. There's no way that I could do something like that. And so I thought, you know, a good title to this message would be, It Doesn't Take a Superhero to Serve the Lord. It takes a person that can do these, these three things. A person that can serve the Lord does not need to be able to fly around, does not need to be able to live heavy suitcases like I did. That was something, wasn't it? Why did she have to come out? It looked so good. They've got to be able to recognize the need, to know what God is and is not calling them to do. And I, I underline that because that can be a problem for us. And finally, to trust in God's provision and act. If you can do those three things, you don't need a red cape. Right? You don't need the fancy boots. You don't need to be able to fly around or shoot whatever it is that he shoots out of his wrist to fly from, hang from buildings, if you can recognize the need, if you can know what God is calling you to do, and you can trust him and act, you can serve him. It doesn't take a superhero. It takes a person like you and a person like me. I want you to turn in your Bible to Joshua chapter 1 because this is, this is what I think is a per, uh, it's just a perfect example. I know all of you are so surprised that I'm going to the Old Testament, aren't you? Wow, I can't believe it. And what a book to end on. What a guy. You know, I've been thinking, I've been toying with the idea. Everybody calls me Josh around here. But I've, I've wanted to kind of step it up. You know, now that I'm, now that I'm going into this higher educational level. And uh, people aren't calling me your majesty like I wanted. And a few. But uh, so I'm thinking Joshua. What do you think? Do the whole thing. Joshua. Wouldn't that be nice? Doesn't that sound a little more, um, I don't even want to know what you said. It probably, I like it, I like it. But in Joshua chapter 1, we have a man that has been the leader of the army, at least in major battles of the Israelites. He's going to be even more of a leader as we come into this book. But he's been under... Moses. Moses has been the main man. And if you remember Moses, Moses wasn't exactly a superhero, was he? But everybody remembers Moses. Boy, he's the guy that led the people out of Egypt, parted the Red Sea, defeated the Amalekites, brought the people through the wilderness, brought them up to the land. I mean, what a guy. The, the law of Moses. He's got five books almost dedicated to him, or four. But, but, but what a guy. And Moses was somebody. But you know, when he was called in, back in the book of Exodus, was he all excited about going, about serving the Lord? No, he made up all kinds of excuses. This is why I can't do it. This is why I can't. And I think it's interesting that as we come into the book of Joshua, we see these words. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun. Moses had been terrified to take over that role leading the people, leading them out, leading them through the desert. He'd been terrified. He was no superhero. He didn't know how to do that. He didn't have the strength. He didn't have the power. He said, I don't know how to even talk. And this man had served the Lord faithfully. And now he had died, and the Lord comes to his servant, Joshua, and says, Joshua, it's your turn. It's your turn to pick up the reins. It's your turn to serve me even though you're pretty scared yourself. And God says, you can see three things from the text here that Joshua is required to do. Here's the first. He needs to be able to recognize that there's a need. Now, this was pretty apparent to Joshua, wasn't it? Because, you know, the Lord said, knock, knock, knock. Hey, Joshua, there's a need. There's a gap here. Moses, my servant, is dead. And in the next verses, you're going to see, I want you to lead the people now. I remember working in the service, there was a guy that, we, we had these radios uh, in the Air Force, and uh, we had the, these trucks that we would drive around. 
And whenever something would happen, whenever a plane would break, whenever something would go wrong, they'd call on the radio and they'd call out to everybody and they'd say, we have, you know, a broken radio. We need somebody to come out here and fix it. Now, the guys that really wanted to work well, what did they do? Turn the radio up. If they were in the bathroom, if they were eating lunch, they'd have that thing sitting there. So whenever the call came, they knew there was a need and they could spring into action. I wasn't necessarily like that. Sometimes uh, the volume would somehow go down on my radio. And I'd go into the gym and I'd be working out. And people would have to go searching all over the squadron for me. This is before I really gave my life to the Lord, though, so it's okay. Just kidding. I didn't want to recognize that there was a need. How many people have ever been like that? At work, you know, you just kind of, you know, la, 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 la. You know, it, Tara, Tara says, uh, Paige's diaper needs to be changed. And I, it, volume goes up a little bit, you know. She comes, didn't you hear me? No, uh, no what, what? You know, I don't recognize that there's a need there. I don't see the void, uh, something that needs to be filled. We just kind of block those things out. We kind of ignore them. You don't have to have a superpower to be able to hear the phone when it rings, right? When God calls you and, and you see that there's a need, all you have to do is be willing to hear it. When the phone rings, you just listen for it. I think about these announcements that were given this morning. You know, we got a need here. we got a need there. We, we, we've got a ABBA. Somebody needs to be a liaison for ABBA. Uh, something with CBC. I wasn't really listening because this is my last Sunday. Um, <laughs> see, I wasn't listening for the phone. But there are needs out here. All you have to do is... Listen for them. I think so many people say, I couldn't do that, I couldn't do that, I'm not capable, I'm not capable. It's pretty easy to recognize that there's a need. You know, Superman was flying around and he saw that, that train as it was barreling down. He recognized that there was a gap that needed to be filled in there, needed to be filled in on that train track, right? He saw the need. But guess what? I'm leaving. You might not believe it, but I do things around here. How many people don't believe that? <laughs> there are going to be some gaps that are going to open up and they're going to need to be filled are you willing to listen for the needs are you willing to recognize that something might need to be done by you by you if you can recognize a need you're halfway there Joshua did but not only did he see that there was a need, he recognized what his role was. How many people have had children that you wanted to tie their shoelaces for them when they were learning to tie them? Nobody? I mean, you, come on now. You, you know, they're tying it. <laughs> right? And they're, they're sitting there for 15 minutes, and they're a bunny the loop, he hops around, and you're like, God, just, just give me the shoe. we got to go. <laughs> no, no, Mommy. No, no. No, no, Mommy. He did, and the bunny, and there's some kind of hole, and I, he went for a walk, and you're sitting there, you know, I see a need. <laughs> I recognize a need for me to get to the grocery store, but, but there's a problem here, and I'm capable of fulfilling that role. And so do you do it? Not if you want your kids to wear something other than Velcro their entire lives, because they've got to work at it and tie that shoe, just like I did when I turned 14. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was 12. It's one thing to be able to recognize all the needs that are out here in this church, that are out there in your marriage, that are out there with your kids, that are out there at your job. You can recognize all the needs in the world, but you've got to know which ones God is calling you to fill. You see, because I was talking to someone in the church uh, that I won't mention her name, a wonderful girl, and she said, uh, she said yeah, I was, I was working with the kids, and we were doing face painting, and uh, I was really good at this particular part of the face painting process out at Apple Blossom. I think that's where it was. And I kept doing it, and I kept doing it, and I kept doing it. 
And someone came up to me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, you really ought to be over here doing this job because you're taking up a seat that somebody else could be, could be filling. See, you're doing the job that God is intending for someone else to do. Let me give you an example that's very practical. I'm terrified when I stand out there. If all you on this side of the room, and you come by and shake my hand at the end, I'm very terrified. I'll just admit that to you right now. Uh, that's really hard for me to do, to stand out there and to shake everybody's hand. Am I going to remember their name? But were they here last week? How many weeks has it been since they've been here? Did they have an aunt that got sick last week? It, did that ingrown toenail get fixed? Am I going to remember all these things? And so I'm, hello, uh, what's her name? Hey, hi, it's great to see you, buddy. You know, I'm terrified. So what do you think I did? For the first couple of years I was here, I sat right up there in that sound booth and said, boy, they need me up here. There is a job that needs to be filled up here. You need this stuff to come up on the screens, Pastor. And so, you know, I, this is a need, and I'm, I'm going to fill it. You know, it's getting done pretty well now. I got a couple boys down here that know how to do that. Josh is in charge up there now. It's a great name, by the way, Josh. <laughs> I'm down here doing the job that God intended for me to do the job that God has called me to do. See, that was a need, but it wasn't my job to fill it. God was not calling me to do that. Let me explain. It says here that Moses, my servant, is dead, Joshua 1, 2. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. What did Joshua do before this? He was Moses' servant. There's a, there's a chapter back in Exodus, I think it's Exodus 17, where they're fighting the Amalekites. Everybody remember the Amalekites? If you do, you should probably be up here teaching. They're fighting the Amalekites, and here's Moses, and he's up on the mountain. And he's got people up there on the mountain with him, and Joshua's down in the valley fighting. Joshua was called to be the leader of the army at that time, not to lead the nation of Israel. He did the job that he was called to do. What if he'd have gone up to Moses and said, all right, buddy, boy, step aside. God's going to put me in charge here in a few years, so go ahead and take a seat. Let me get started now. That probably wouldn't have worked. God would have probably sent an earthquake or something, you know, suck Joshua down. And, of course, Joshua is much better than that because of his name. All Joshua's are tremendous, tremendous men. I bet he was pretty handsome, too, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Joshua knew his role. He knew what he was supposed to do and when he was supposed to do it and not beforehand. Folks, are, are you doing things in your marriage? Wives, let me talk to you for a second. You have a husband that maybe doesn't do his job in the house as well as you think he should. Do you think that he doesn't take a leadership responsibility maybe as well as he should? And so you say, there's a deficit in this household. We don't have good leadership like we should. And so you know what? I'm going to fulfill a need. See a need, fill a need. And I see one, and I'm going to fulfill it. Don't raise your hands, please. Because that's, that's a serious question. What happens when you take over your husband's job after six months, a year, two years, ten years? He says, well, if it's going to get done anyway, might as well just sit back and play video games. If she's going to run the household, she's going to discipline the kids, she's going to take the kids to school and tell them what to do and tell me what to do and just tell me when I need to take the garbage out and whatever, fine, I'll let her run the show. And then what do you end up doing? Boy, that husband of mine, I tell you, he's just worthless. Sitting at home doing nothing. Guess whose fault it is? Big part of it's yours. Fathers, you got kids that are a little rebellious? You letting them tie their own shoes? You see, if you let them tie their own shoes, a lot of times they'll say, huh, I learned to do this on my own. I had some help from Dad, but I feel like I can do it on my own now. I feel like I'm a man, and Dad showed me how to do it instead of doing it for me. And now I can make my own decisions. I can think for myself. I know what to do because Dad has trained me to do it. 
What happens if you go give a man a fish? You got to give him a fish the next day, right? But what do you do? You give him a pole and say, let me show you how to do this. Your job is to teach your son and your daughter how to fish, not give them fish. Wives, your job is to let your husband be the head of the household, period. If you start filling in the gaps there, it's not going to work. Let me get real, real practical here with the church. We talk about the window washing that needs to happen. I'll bet anybody ever heard the 80-20 rule? 80% of the people do 20% of the work? No, that's true, because that means 20% have to do 80%. Come on, I'm right. I'm Joshua. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Isn't that true in any organization? So that 20% could say, okay, well, I'm, I'm doing nursery, and I, uh, I, I play the piano, and uh, I help set up chairs when they need to be set up, and I work in the fellowship committee, well, but I can wash windows. That's not hard. It's just two more hours a week, so let me just go ahead and do that. Right? If there's a need, you could fill it. What's the problem? That person that's sitting there going, ooh, you know, I don't do anything around here. Maybe I should, oh, oh, well, it's already done. Okay. Recognize what God has and has not called you to do. Because to tell you the truth, in this church, we have a lot of stallions that we have to rein in, not a lot of mules that we have to kick. You know what I mean? We have a lot of people that want to do everything. We really do. It's a lot easier to rein in a stallion than it is to kick a mule and get him going, right? So we, our problem is don't do everything. Let the mules, whoever they might be, do something. Let them see the need and let them fill it. Know what God has called you and what God has not called you to do. So <laughs> what's this? Anybody know? If you, it's an awesome roller coaster. Which one? The Superman. Is that Allie? Where's Allie? There she is. You know this one, don't you? Because that's Allie right there. You see her with her eyes closed? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. We went to uh, Six Flags with Janelle's class. And Allie had never been on a roller coaster. Wave, Allie. Go ahead, wave. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Allie had never been on a roller coaster. And we, some people said, you know, you should go on the Superman first. By the way, right here is 205 feet. And that's called straight down. <laughs> 205 feet is very high. I've been on a lot of roller coasters, and I had my eyes closed. So this was the first one that Allie went on. Allie, how many times did you go on that? Once. <laughs> this is very high. This is the Superman. And I think Allie's problem is probably like mine was. You know that that roller coaster is secure, right? I mean, look at this steel. If you've watched, uh, what's that show on the History Channel, I think? How, it's, yeah, How It's Made. Is that what it is? Where they, I saw one where they built a roller coaster. These things are just... I mean, I could probably lift them, but you guys, you saw the, these things are strong, right? And they run them thousands of times. And, and, and how many times, it's like a plane crashing, you know, it's one, one in a million shot. I mean, you get on a roller coaster, you're going to get back off, right? Practically speaking. And so we know it's safe. There are 20 other people in the cars with you. You know it's going to be okay. You trust this thing, except what? You don't get on because you're terrified. Because you say, I know it'll hold me. And if I ask you, Allie, Allie, will that thing hold? Will you think it'll hold you? She'll say, yeah, I know it'll hold me, but I'm not getting on because that's real scary. And I'd say, yeah, amen, sister. Amen. <laughs> we know that God will provide. So did Joshua. I mean, Joshua had seen it. But you see this phrase? It occurs no less than six times directed at Joshua. Three times here in the chapter. 
be strong, be courageous. It happens back in Deuteronomy 31. It happens up in verse 18 later on in the chapter. God tells him three times in this call, be strong, be courageous. How many people are ever afraid in life? I had someone tell me once, don't you ever admit that you're scared. Don't you ever admit it as a pastor. If I point a 45 at you, Rachel, you going to be scared? I mean, you trust God, though, don't you? I mean, if I shoot you and you die, that was God's plan. Why are you scared? Yeah, what are you, an idiot? Because you're pointing a gun at me. She didn't say, what are you, an idiot? But I, you could see it in her eyes. <laughs> Joshua was terrified because of the job he was getting ready to do. He had to go in against people that were huge. Would you be scared? I would. Was Gideon scared with 300 people? You better believe it, folks. And that's why God says this. Be strong and courageous. Because what? I'm with you. Folks, serving the Lord, like standing in the back of that vestibule, for me, it's terrifying sometimes. And I say terrifying, and you guys go, whatever, terrifying to shake my hand. It is. For you, that might not be a problem. You might be terrified to come up here and speak like I am. Serving the Lord in the Christian life is, is often very scary. But you've got to be strong and courageous because God is with you. He's not going to ever ask you to do something that you can't handle. If you're sitting out there and you're saying, you know what, I really think I can work three hours into my schedule to wash windows. You might not be all that terrified of doing that. But if Pastor Ladder comes up to you and says, hey, I need you to hand out tickets at the Apple Blossom to people that are walking by, remember that story? That's terrifying. What did I have to say? Free face painting. Get your face painted for free. Remember that? Remember that story I told you? And remember what I did for the first five minutes? And he's standing there going, now. You know, people are walking by looking at me like, what's this bozo doing? <laughs> it's a terrifying experience, but be strong. Be courageous because the Lord is with you. Bottom line it for me, Josh. What do I do when God pricks my heart? When I see that there's something that needs to be done, what do I do? Does it take a superhero to serve the Lord in this church? Does it take a superhero to serve the Lord in my home? What do I do? Boil it down. Here we go. Number one, get a new battery. See the need, right? See the need. Number two, know your role. Anybody remember the rock? Ooh, I got one. That was his big phrase. He was a, he was a wrestler. I shouldn't admit that I know that. But he was one of those professional wrestlers. Know your role. That's what he would say. This is in a different context, but I'll just move on. <clears throat> know what God has called you to do and what he has not called you to do. Don't take somebody else's blessing from them. You do what God has called you to do. See the need, know your role, trust and act. If you do that, you can be super in your own right. Let me share a final example with you of a person that did this. A believer, I think, just from reading literature about him. Let me read this article to you. Quote, are you guys ready? Let's roll. Flight 93. That's how Todd Beamer lived, and that's how he died, helping to lead a takeover by passengers on United Airlines Flight 93, which crashed Tuesday in Somerset County. It was the fourth plane to go down in last week's terrorist attacks. Beamer, 32, told the GTE supervisor, Lisa Jefferson, that he and others on the plane had decided they would not be pawns in the hijacker's suicidal plot. Beamer's call connected at 9.45 a.m. He told Jefferson there were three hijackers armed with knives. One of the men had what appeared to be a bomb tied to his midsection with a red belt. 
Beamer, nine other passengers, and five flight attendants were ordered to sit on the floor in the rear of the plane. He did not know the whereabouts of the pilot, co-pilot, and the remaining passengers. Two of the hijackers were in the cockpit with the door locked behind them. The man with the bomb stayed in the back of the plane near Beamer's group. Beamer then told Jefferson that he and the others had decided to jump on the hijacker wearing the bomb. Jefferson could hear shouts and commotion, and then Beamer asked her to pray with him. They recited the 23rd Psalm. He got Jefferson to promise that she would call his family, then dropped the phone, leaving the line open. That's when Jefferson heard what Lisa Beamer believes were her husband's last words. Let's roll. Lisa Beamer said reports of her husband's heroic role had made my life worth living again. Jefferson kept her promise and called Lisa Beamer at 8 p.m. on Friday. It was the best thing I could have gotten. It totally changed the mood around here, Lisa Beamer said. We all knew what kind of person Todd was. We know he's in heaven. He was saved. Just knowing that when the crisis came up, he maintained the same character we all knew. It's a testament to what real faith means. Todd Beamer was an average guy, had a nine-to-five job. But when a crisis arose, when a need arose, he saw it. He knew what his role was in it. If he had decided to jump the bomber as opposed to letting the other people do that, the whole plan could have gone to pot. He needed to let them do their job and him do his job. He knew the need. He knew his role. And he trusted the Lord and acted. How can we, as believers in this church, going out into this community, into our lives, do anything less? Be strong and courageous. Trust the Lord and act.